but there's still we've got about five minutes left, so. And some no, I, I told some some of the, the people like I don't know, so you know, just help me <laughs> in terms of, of what you need. I don't know who that auntie is. Cabo might know who that auntie is. Which, which one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Auntie that Benny is now shaking hands with. Hi, hi, kids. Helen, who's are you? Which one? Okay. Uh, 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 no, 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 guys. no. no. <laughs> What's your relationship with Mr. Kitty? <laughs>
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Goedemorgen, dames en heren. A warm welcome to the University of the Western Cape. We are about to start the celebration. May I ask each and every person as you enter to please take the walk, your seat speedily. To those who are seated, thank you very much for being here. Um, we, we really, really want to have a fun time today. Uh, all the smiling faces here today, it's, it's absolutely awesome from this podium. So if we can hold that pose until all of this celebrations is done for the morning, we're well on cue. So very good morning, a warm welcome. We will be starting our proceedings very, very soon. And we will cue you as soon as the arch and the entourage is ready to enter the building. Thank you very much. Justice, the trial was heard. When the sentence was passed, there was anger in the air. A man of vision had been told. My attending a situation and a situation woman. Molo and him listen and I'm tinjana. I'm trying to just love for get coca lama coca quality to a little long Tibani so. Melapa and I'm trying to get a lot of gas and sell a senior to quite a long South Africa. Silapa and I'm trying to just look at the room to go to two. We go among a lot of Zagates, Zagatima, Zagam Contuba, Food, Zagatapu, Zagatan, Zamatota. Silapanga, Yanaka, Silo, Itulana, Sola Matota, Petra Vila, we are some Tata. Silapanga, Yanaka Matota, Wabatuana, we don't be Sabatuana, um foot is up for me, Santa, who pitch up on a silver and a dingy. Wako wali tanda ase kwani la samsha butlange ne. Silapa na mshanja si zauti hala hala bishop tutu hala hala. Silapa na mshanja si zauti zuliba pelinga choni. Nama banyate liba samsha butlange ne. Besiti kwa usiti paso na bo mimtuwa na mshe. Na mshanja mazo kubuka. Na mshanja mazo kubukela. Na mshanja mazo kubo nisu tando. The city is a contrast, the mass and tell us, Gavan and Telenia, Sinigunia Perekile. 
Dagata matota kutwa ikoni sibana mkwazani. Silapa na mkanja sisiti kamtuwa na mtu silima mperinga choni. Kumaka na kuziate ati nyanya, ziate ati sikuwele sa semta butangene. Kuyate ati ukamate wa matinga, uti misome nziyako kala kibona kele lubala. Silapa na mkanja sisongina. Sisiti kala kuze bishop is the filament of freedom. The kailis of consciousness. The coronal of people's cause. The enter of amica blue solutions. The pillar of peace. Yala anjo si siti gola sabo. Zulima peninga choni. Waya. Waya. Wayu. Wayu. Dekham. Yo. Good morning. My name is Nfundo Walaza. I'm the CEO of the Desmond Tutu Peace Center. I'm the program director for this morning's proceedings. On behalf of the trustees of the Desmond Tutu Peace Center, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to the inaugural Desmond Tutu International Peace Lecture an African warm welcome to all the international guests and friends who have traveled far and away to be with us today. Thank you for your presence. A special welcome to the entire Tutu family who are with us today and all the VIPs that are with us today. Warm welcome to you, Mayor and uh, our board members, uh, including the Minister of Human Settlement, uh, Mr. Togyo Sekwale, who's with us today. I would like to welcome the stage party. Welcome to you, Archbishop, and happy birthday. Welcome to Mrs. Tutu, and thank you for your presence here, Mama. A warm welcome to the chairman of the Desmond Tutu Peace Trust, Advocate Dumisan Zabeza. Thank you. He will introduce this lecture today. Welcome to you, Prof. Brian O'Connell, the Vice Chancellor of the University of the Western Cape. A welcome to our moderator, Professor Judith Mayotte. The chair will introduce you later. We've got an empty chair for His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. We're pleased and honored that he is with us. Can we please <laughs> welcome His Holiness? Can you please rise and welcome him? Please rise and welcome him.
your holiness, we are pleased that you are with us today. I extend a warm welcome to you and thank you for agreeing to share your message of peace and compassion with us today and with the global community, which we also welcome because this is virtual, so we've got people across the world linking in to this lecture today. At this moment, I will call upon Reverend uh, Busak to lead us with a short prayer. If you can come on stage, please. As he comes, can I please, I would like all of us to stand and observe a moment of silence in prayerful meditation as we prepare our minds and souls to receive the wisdom and blessing from the two great spiritual leaders of our time. A moment of silence, please, and then Reverend will lead us with a prayer. Let us pray. Our wonderful and gracious God, creator of us all and all things in this earth, that you have bequeathed to us as your children to guide, to guard, to hold dear and to cherish. You who have called us through your love and sustained us through your grace and mercy. We thank you for this wonderful day today and for this wonderful moment in the life of Desmond Tutu, your servant, his family, and the life of South Africans as a nation. We thank you for this moment of reflection on that great calling that you have placed upon us who love you and who seek to walk in your footsteps, namely to seek justice and peace through all the earth. And that, that, foot, that calling is being heard by so many across the world, from your child and servant, the Dalai Lama, to your child and servant, Desmond Mpilu Tutu, to your children and servants, as all of us are gathered here in this hall and across the world, we pray that in your loving mercy you will today descend upon this gathering and that you will bless us by touching each of us and touching the lips of those who will speak so that the words that will come will be words of wisdom that will offer us sustenance in the struggle for justice and peace that does not end until your kingdom is established from corner to corner throughout the earth. Hear us today as we call upon your holy name and as we ask for your presence even now so that as we leave this hall, we shall be walking tall knowing that we have been touched again by your hand. We have been shown the way. We have gathered together to be strengthened in you so that we will do what you require, namely to do justice, to know mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce to you Professor Brian O'Connell, the Vice Chancellor of the University of the Western Cape. Professor O'Connell will welcome you to this great institution. Thank you. There was a time when my first words would have been Amanda. 
Good morning to all of you. The Archbishop Tutu, his dear wife Leah, the Tutu family, and all our friends. This hall is a very, very special place. Much has happened in this hall to make South Africa a better place, we hoped, than it was in the 70s and 80s. In this hall, large numbers of people gathered and with passion proclaimed our determination to be free. So I welcome you to this uh, hall. I hope that as you entered, those of you who have come here for the first time, that you might have been pleasantly surprised at um, what the University of the Western Cape has accomplished, uh, especially during the time that Archbishop Tutu has been our Chancellor. So I want to sincerely welcome you to our celebration of the 80th birthday, in fact part of that was yesterday, of our Chancellor and to this lecture which bears his name. It would have been wonderful indeed if we could have had the event as originally planned, with the Dalai Lama here sitting in that chair that is now empty, and I in person, but I wish to express my regret, my sadness, and my bewilderment. UWC has been blessed indeed to have had such a long relationship with the Archbishop and his family. He has consistently helped us to think and rethink who we are. Think and rethink who we are. Because the danger is that we can very, very easily lose our sense of humanity, especially when times are troubled, especially in those sorts of times that uh, we are called upon uh, to be pa peaceful, to be patient, to discuss and make good decisions. A strong lesson we have learned from the arch is a truth spoken many, many years ago by Thomas Hobbes when he said, in order to flourish, we must not have war, we must be at peace. And he also said, we must have many, many friends. Our arch practices this dictum with his entire being. In reflecting on human history, one is struck by the homage paid to men of war. Throughout the world we find statues of them erected in, in, the, in squares, and as an, our national celebrations we bring out all our arms and our uh, instruments of war, and we march our soldiers to stirring martial music to show our strength. When when will we see the squares of the world filled with statues to the people of peace? Blessed be the peacemakers, we say. We had a notion until recently, I was to say internationally, we have had a notion until recently that your safety lies in protecting yourself from the other, from cutting yourself off from their presence or their ideas. We know now that that is fanciful, as we will experience here today. UWC is proud to be hosting this first Desmond Tutu International Peace Lecture, and thanks to modern technology, while we would have chosen our speaker to have been in that chair, he is with us still. We humans must undergo a paradigm shift in the way we think and act, as in the next 30 to 40 years, we're going to find our humanity under incredible stress. And then it'll be the time of the war makers that find it easy to do so. And it's in that time that the peacemakers will really, really have to come forward and teach us again what it is to be human. Welcome, Arch. Great to have you here. Um, you must know when the Arch comes to cap our students, unfortunately he's now an international person. And uh, I say here, yeah, we must be kind and we must be generous. We've had him for so, so long. He's done so much more, so much for us. But the world needs him now. And we must say to them, we, get, we, we grant you the honor of having an arch with you. But when the times that he, that he, at the times when he is here, this place reverberates. You can just feel the energy as everybody is drawn into this person. And at the end of which he gets up and he makes us all laugh. And while we are laughing, he throws in a punch that has us all say, oh, good. <laughs> My favorite arch joke is the one where he speaks about the man falling down. A, I think it's a wonderful joke falling down the cliff, sheer, halfway down, nothing to save him, he's dead. Halfway down, there's a little stump sticking out from the, the, um, an old tree that was once there, and he grabs this, and he hangs there, and he starts praying, and he says, is there anybody up there? <laughs> and eventually God answers, and he says, what is it, my son? He says, God, I've got a problem here. <laughs> Can you help? 
And God says, my son, have faith. Just let go of this and I'll catch you down there. <laughs> and he pauses like this and he lifts his eyes to heaven and he says, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome all of you to this presentation, this, uh, this wonderful lecture. We must think of ourselves as peace lovers, otherwise you would not be here. Welcome also to our beautiful campus where we, today we will share and hear beautiful thoughts. God bless you. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yeah, and then at least we are not at a funeral. We are at a celebration. We should know that we are celebrating one of the people whose laughter you can hear from anywhere. So please cheer up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning of this year, 2011, the Desmond Tutu Peace Trust, whose project is the Desmond Tutu Peace Center, through his board of trustees, decided that this was a significant year in which the Desmond Tutu Peace Center, in consultation with the founders, should present to you a theme that is going to be as topical as it was concurrent. Hence, peace and compassion. You will know that in the continent, there was a lot of upheaval, particularly to the north of us, in what is known as the Arab North. And it was in that context that we felt that the Desmond Tutu Peace Trust, having dedicated itself to a message of peace for the world should have its first international lecture. You have been told that it would have been the Dalai Lama who would have been delivering the lecture. But through technology, we have found a moderator who it is my pleasure to introduce to you. Born in Kansas um, in 1937, on the 25th of January, <laughs> Judith N. Mayotte, um, in her first year in the college, was struck with polio. But for 10 years, she was a nun in the Catholic Church and a doctorate at Marquette University, married Mr. Jack Mayotte for a mere three years before he succumbed to cancer, produced television shows for several broadcast stations, winning several awards in the process. In the late 80s, 1989 to be precise, Judith Mayotte used a grant from MacArthur Foundation to proceed to live alone in Eritrea, in the Sudan, in Pakistan, in Thailand, and Cambodia, otherwise known as Cambodia. Her work was on the plight of refugees. In one of her travels to the Sudan, on behalf of Refugees International, gathering information on Operation Lifeline Sudan. In a freak accident, she met with a near tragic incident that led to her current disablement. Judith survived and was not done yet with her work in the world of peace and caring for the marginalized in society being the voice of the voiceless. In the field of academia, Judith has taught on the faculty of this university, 
of Seattle University, John Hopkins University, theology professor at Marquette, receiving in the process several awards, notably Refugee Voices Annual uh, Award and Refugees International 1994 Award. She has served on the Desmond Tutu Peace Foundation Board in the United States, and I was privileged to sit with her in the Desmond Tutu Peace Trust Board in a career peppered with accolades. Judith's latest awards were as a recipient of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation's World Citizenship Award the first Desmond Tutu Distinguished Chair in Global Understanding for the Semester at Sea in 2010. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in the year in which the Desmond Tutu Peace Center chose to inaugurate the first of what will be annual series of dialogues on issues of peace, compassion, care, humility. And more appropriately today, in the very month, no, almost to the day, when we should be celebrating the nomination and award to three African women as Nobel Peace Laureates, President Ellen Johnson Salif, Letima Hobi, Tawal Kaman, the heroine of the April Spring Revolutions, who, I ask, ladies and gentlemen, would have been more apt, more appropriate to engage in dialogue the two Nobel Peace Laureates, the two holiest men in the world, the Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Pino Tutu and His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, than Judith N. Mayot, a humanitarian. <laughs> yes, yes. And a humanitarian an author, a theologian, an Emmy Award winning producer, a former nun, an ethicist, and a university professor. Ladies and gentlemen, Judy Spiot. I already told them about you. <laughs> I heard. <laughs> I heard. 
your voice yeah. through BBC, yeah. uh, you really use very, uh, very, very kind words for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. spiritual leaders, but the other thing that I see in both His Holiness the Dalai Lama and our Archbishop Tutu is a magnificent friendship that the two of them have formed and their wonderful capacity to celebrate life and friendship. And while it is a real pity that His Holiness cannot be here in a chair sitting next to Archbishop Tutu to have this conversation this morning. We are so grateful for the world of technology that has come to us and that we can have this conversation. And so I'm going to open my questions this morning with a question on friendship um, and the friendship of these two very special people. Um, you come from very different cultural and religious backgrounds, and yet you found each other somehow and came together in this beautiful friendship. And I'd just like to know, and I think all of us would like to know, what is it that draws you to each other? Um, what do you recognize in each other? That he's younger, yes, let him speak first. I think elder one. <laughs> I always respect you. The first you, uh, you may comment. All right. <laughs> I believe I have met one of, if not the, well, one of the holiest people in the world someone who has amazed me at the fact that he has been in exile over 50 years and where you expected him to be bitter and angry, he's actually a bundle of joy. I have sometimes got to tell him because he is, in fact, quite mischievous. Uh, I, I have to warn him uh, sometimes and say, hey, 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 look here. <coughs> the cameras are on us. You, you need to try and behave like a holy man. <laughs> but as you... As you know, everywhere in the world where he goes, they have to find the largest venue because so many people want to hear him. And uh, I mean, once we went to Seattle and the, the largest place was a football stadium over 60,000 people were waiting there, waiting for someone who actually can't even speak English properly. No, I am <laughs> 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 And 
and I, I really want to assure you, I'm not jealous. No, no, no. <laughs> But he just is a fantastic human being. And your holiness, we turn it over to you. So, when I, when I meet people, first I consider the other just another human being. So from my side also, whenever I met someone, I always feel I am another human being. So, the quality on that level, I consider the most important. Now, you, Archbishop Tutu, on that level, I think you yourself, completely free, you act as a human being. So, to that, on that level, we can develop genuine trust. Uh, on that basis, genuine friendship comes. So, you, sometimes when you uh, describe me as mischievous, as you just mentioned, <laughs> I return you, you also a mischievous person. <laughs> but then logically, two mischievous people, two mischievous person automatically develop special sort of friendship. <laughs> then secondly, you genuine religious believer. You always carry the true message of Jesus Christ. I consider you as a man of truth, man of honesty. Uh, so that also one reason I develop respect and friendship. But then also I think the time also one factor. I, I can't remember which year we first met, but since then, many occasions, we had opportunity meeting. Whenever we two together, the atmosphere immediately changed, full of joys, full of sort of the news, like that. So, uh, and then thirdly, you actually implement what you believe in critical period in your own country, uh, the, the movement of reconciliation is really sort of the real sort of practical sort of service to a society where bitterness or distrust there. So these are reasons I develop respect and become uh, very close Friend. Human friend, this is a friend. That's that's sort of my, my view. Those are beautiful views from both of you. And one of the things that I observe uh, in your relationship to one another is a beautiful playfulness and an affection that comes. Uh, with this friendship, and I just wonder what you feel is the role of playfulness um, in a friendship, just briefly to follow up. Of course, naturally, there are problems. Yeah. So some, I'll say, the unnecessary difficulty, essentially, our own creation, many of them our own creation. So in such sort of circumstances, uh, laughter, sorry, laughter, humor, then really create calm atmosphere, a warm atmosphere. 
that's very important. With that kind of atmosphere, then discuss seriously which point we are facing. Other hand, the things are difficult to discuss. And on top of that, atmosphere also creates more difficulty. What use? After all, they also want happy life. Also, you see, I love smile. This site also loves smile. So then, better to create more friendly atmosphere and let know each other as a human brother, sisters. We both do not want suffering, do not want a problem. So let us try to solve this source of problem. That's my belief. Yes. I, I think, I mean, that uh, he, He makes holiness so attractive. <laughs> you know, he, um, there's, there's far too much, I think, solemnity. And I, I once saw a wonderful uh, picture, uh, which, which was a picture of uh, Peter and, and two other disciples. And, 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 and Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was laughing uproariously, throwing his head back, and, and the caption was, Jesus laughing at a joke Peter told. So frequently, actually, we, we think of our I mean, like, I mean, of our Lord Jesus as a sour pass. You know, yes, he was solemn because he, he saw so many ugly things. But can we imagine someone who was a sour pass attracting children? I mean, he was very attractive to children because he exuded a joy, a deep joy. And, and, and look at some of the stories he tells. You couldn't have told, I mean, the story of the guy who comes along and, and says, hey, hey, you, 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 look, 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 you, you have a splinter in your eye. And Jesus tells the story, hey, how can you see this splinter in this guy's eye when you've got a whole beam? I mean, the people must have been ro rolling in the aisles when he told that one. And he can't have been telling <laughs> I think he's very uh, playful. He was playful and fun. Uh, and, and that was why he, he, he was so attractive. And maybe that is why he could cry. Um, today, um, we were going to have Your Holiness come to us and speak on peace and compassion as a catalyst for change. And since you are not here physically with us, we'd like to know what the kernel of that message would have been. What is the, um, the core message that you would have brought to us here uh, at the University of the Western Cape in the very first Desmond Tutu International uh, Peace Lecture? I uh, say I am one of the nearly seven billion human beings. Uh, the future of humanity depends on our generation. Of course, future depends on present. So we have opportunity to create happier future or possible future. Of course, major disaster, these are beyond our control. 
but all those usually I call man-made problems actually are own creation. Yet nobody wants problem. Nobody wants problem. Uh, yet we created by ourselves some of the problems. So this ultimately see here not only in brain but here uh, more hatred suspicion distrust jealousy then creates these destructive activities or destructive emotion uh, so the first uh, i mean in order to change things or better, the first, uh, not only uh, sort of sufficient, sort of, what is it, the smart brain, but here we must uh, develop warm-heartedness, sense of concern of others' well-being. Just like myself, they also want happy life. So that kind of motivation sense of concern of others' well-being. Once that motivation is there, then there is no room to want to develop desire, harm other, bully other, cheating other, because you love them. So therefore, the change, better world, more peaceful world, more truthful world, first sort of source must develop in individual heart that's compassion sense of concern of others will be uh, now here i usually you see uh to follow two ways one way to more compassion through religious belief god is infinite love. God loves us. Uh, so we must and the entire humanity creature of God. So uh, to that kind of belief respect other love other. Then another way of world without talking religious belief Basic human nature. Now, according to some scientific sort of research, they find more compassionate heart. Your physical condition becomes better, more healthier. Angry, angers, hatred, fear, suspicions constantly keep here your physical need. So therefore, practice of compassion is not only sort of concern about next life, next to the heaven, or some other things, or from Buddhist viewpoint, salvation. Not only for these things, but day to day life, family level, community level, global level, the real precious thing. Within, within us is warm heartedness. So, I usually, you see, try to make clear, but people, the ultimate source of your own well-being, your own sort of uh, happy life is within your, your yourself. So, pay, take, pay more attention about this inner value. So, is it correct? Okay. <laughs> if, if, you, if, if, you, if you agree these views, then don't call me mischievous. <laughs>
warm-heartedness certainly comes through in that, Your Holiness. Uh, every bit of that. And I would turn to you, Archbishop, for a moment, and ask you now, um, there was a time when I was in war zones all over the world, and I kept seeing people destroy one another and destroy villages and homes and communities. And I kept asking the question, how do we get upstream? How do we prevent wars from happening to begin with? How do we learn how to build a culture of peace, to promote a positive peace yeah. in our hearts and in our world? And how would you um, respond to that? It's actually very straightforward. <laughs> let, <laughs> let women take over. That is actually seriously meant. It is to celebrate today the award of the Nobel Peace Prize to three women. It is to say Actually, thinking about Liberia just now, one of the reasons why the war stopped in Liberia was, was because the women of all faiths decided that they were going to pray the devil back to hell. <laughs> and basically, they, they, they told their men folk, enough is enough. Um, I think, I mean, that biologically, women are meant to be are life givers. You know, uh, and I think that when women are truly feminine, when they don't try to ape men, that basically they <laughs> They, they would say, I can't carry a baby in my womb for nine months and then agree for that child to become cannon fodder. Um, you are biologically um, life-giving, life-affirming. That is, that is what you are naturally. What, that is what you are when you are unspoiled. And it's no, it's no, I, I, I think it's no, it's no mistake at all to have said the hand that rocks the cradle, rules the world. I think Hitler turned out as he turned out because Hitler was not dandled by his mommy. Hitler did not get the sense of security 
that made him feel good about himself. And because he felt empty inside, he tried, as bullies tend to do, tried to get the affirmation by being a nasty. And in a way, I, uh, it is an appeal to, to, to women, to mothers. Come into your own. We men are socialized into being macho, aggressive. Even if you, you actually are feeling insecure. And perhaps, as I've sometimes said, half jokingly, that of all of God's creatures, men are the most insecure. And we're very good actors. But I have found it about myself. I, I also facetiously, but really only maybe a third facetiously, I say, well, especially in the United States, I speak and then I get a standing ovation and I ought to feel good. I don't until Leah says later on. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what the, the Dalai Lama was saying about compassion That is what women naturally, I mean, sort of would normally be. We have a saying in one of our, our languages where they say, a mother can share even the eye of a fly. That women, because of this capacity to, to be caring, to be compassionate, to be life-affirming, can actually make society survive that are on the edge. Uh, and I'm quite willing to be a chaplain to that movement. I think all we women and the men folk in here too would give a grateful applause to the Archbishop for the thoughts that you just gave us on that and the, and the, um, the importance today of the uh, awarding to the three women of the Nobel Peace Prize this year. I just wanted to say one more thing. The, the, His Holiness actually is very, very, very modest. Uh, and in some ways, I mean, when he says what he says with some uh, difficulty in the English language, he, <laughs> I still love you, don't worry, yes. Uh, no. It is quite amazing the, the, the work that they have done with people in MIT. Um, I mean, this whole thing where he was speaking about um, 
scientists uh, and uh, doctors discovering, I mean, that, uh, for instance, people who pray, it's been found that it has a positive influence on, on your physical um, capacities. And, and when you are unwell, they, they have found, I mean, as they say scientifically, I don't know, but as they say scientifically, they have found that those people tend to have a better chance of surviving and getting better. Um, the, he's, he's, he's not said everything. He's, he, he, if I may so show, he, he is genuinely modest, uh, but when he was saying that they have found, it's, it's that they have, they've, they've had, I mean, he spent some time um, at, at Harvard where they, they've been working on, on the, the impact of spirituality on, 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 on our well-being, that uh, there is a positive scientific uh, evidence that it is not just a flowery thing, I mean, that the tutus of this world make you have to think. It, it actually does make you better. Uh, that when you are compassionate, your blood pressure tends to be lower than the blood pressure of the person who is aggressive and angry and and we know it. I mean, we have experienced it each in some way that uh, when you are angry, you feel it in your tum-tum. You know, uh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, so I, I just wanted uh, people to be aware that uh, Are you finding more and more that there is a strong hunger for a deepening of spirituality among the peoples of the world? I think. Your yes. Holiness. Well, see, quite a number of places, see, uh, a difference on what's in the races. I notice now people. They began to feel limitation of material value. Because, you see, there are people who are uh, very rich, billionaire. Still, as a person, not happy. Unhappy person. Too much worry, too much anxiety. Too much fear. So therefore, yeah. and and on top of that, as you mentioned, the scientifically, uh, now sort of, what's it, they uh, show very clear sort of what's it, they, uh, uh, finding that the calm mind very good for our health. And the ultimate source of calm mind is open heart, compassionate heart. So as the individual person becomes heavier, healthier, and also their social relation, uh, interaction with other people also improve. Uh, so, uh, so you rightly mean now scientifically, you see, uh, sort of angry, the inner value is very, very important. Now, question is how to propagate that? Uh, may I say so? Uh, not, uh, not like us religious person teaching, not sufficient, but through education system. This is basically, of course, 
form of major religious tradition, the essential practice is love, compassion, forgiveness. But itself, not necessarily religious sort of subject. It is something important, useful for every human being. Even the ecology field, warm-heartedness, sense of discipline, sense of moral principle, these are very, very essential. So, uh, through education, we can educate people from kindergarten to the university level. Warm-heartedness is for their own interest. As much as important about this material value. Material value, very important, very good for our physical comfort. But mental comfort, these inner values are very, very essential. Mm. So I would like to add this something. As my elder spiritual uh, brothers and also elder Nobel laureate stated, <laughs> I usually say, tell you, now this century, 21st century, should be century of dialogue, century of peace. Uh, in order to create peaceful century, it does not mean no longer any problem, any sort of potential threat, potential of conflict. Problem there, so we must find ways and means to solve this problem to peaceful means, that is dialogue. So we must develop this century should be century of dialogue. Previous century become century of violence. So now here, the biologically, as you rightly mentioned, female, more sensitivity about others' pain. Now, some scientists also is mentioned when two person, one male, one female, observing one person's sort of painful experiences, uh, and the response from two person, the female, much stronger response, because biologically more sensitive sensitivity about others' pain. So therefore, now this century. In order to be peaceful century, uh, we must promote the value of compassion, love. For that, now female should take more active role regarding promotion of human compassion, human affection. So, so please you, the moderate moderator. As a female, you should take more active role. Now we, <laughs> now we, now we, now ready to take more rest. You already now retired. <laughs> I also now retired from political leadership. So now, uh, and I really very much missing you since you retired. Now, few occasions, some Nobel laureate meeting, but you are not there. So I always feel something, something missing. <laughs> so this time, I really, very, very eager to visit there, see you. And some exchange of some mischievous word. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, now, uh, now this I really very much enjoy. You see, although physically long distance, uh, but I can see you. your face. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I really feel very, very happy. Yes, no, I wanted to ask 
him one question. My dear brother, I, I know uh, that we, we belong in a mutual admiration society. Uh, but I, was, I, I just wanted to find out from you. I mean, you may have many secrets. <laughs> <coughs> Do you have an army? Spiritual. Spiritual level? Yes, I have army. <laughs> Not weapon. Yes. But wisdom. And compassion. I, I was asking this question only to find out why does the Chinese government fear you? Quite simple. Quite simple. The, some Chinese officials describe me as a demon. So naturally, some fear about demon. <laughs> so when, yes. when I first time heard, you see, that kind of Chinese you see, officials comment, no, I I feel laughing. So I immediately respond, yes, I have home. totalitarian system, and not only communist, but many totalitarian system. Hypocrisy, telling lie, is unfortunately become part of their life. So, you see, someone could tell truth, honestly, truthfully, transparently, those people who carry hypocritic sort of way of life then feel uncomfortable. So, like you, uh, uh, me also, is trying to make clear what's the reality. And also now, in the bad case, I often tell you. 1.3 billion Chinese people sh should have every right to know the reality. Then, 1.3 billion Chinese people also have the ability to judge what's right, what's wrong. So, therefore, censorship is immoral. Mm. reality. So, uh, uh, and then another thing, the people from sort of China, they are sort of judiciary system, still very, very low, becomes sort of the parties of what's in the instrument. So the Chinese judici judiciary system must raise up to international sort of law standard. That's, I think, very, very important. So I'm uh, often, you see, telling when I met some Chinese friends, some professors, some artists, some students, I always telling them, people from China, most of the populated nation and China have sort of great potential to serve, to take a constructive role on this planet. For that, 
Trust from the rest of the world is very, very necessary. Respect, trust from the rest of the world is very necessary. For that reason, transparency is very essential. So, you also, I think many people listen to you, trust you, so speak these points. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. It, it seems like um, when you were asking the question and you were responding, some of that, um, that mischievousness and that playfulness came through. But there was a real seriousness in what you were saying and the transparency and the trust that is so important um, that we bring in trying to resolve so many of the crucial issues that we have in our world today. And I think, too, of the Arab Spring, uh, for example, and the role of youth that, that they have played um, in this um, Arab Spring. And the way in which um, it started out more for um, the citizens, for example, of Libya, and now seems to be more of a fight for the resources of that country. Um, how do we turn some of that around and really create that kind of environment of compassion and a, and a kind of environment of accountability in those who govern and in the international bodies like the United Nations? Um, and how do we instill um, in the youth the generation to, that is coming forward now um, these visions and values that you two so beautifully portray in your life and, um, and want to pass on to them? Your, no. your turn. You have more experience, and particularly <laughs> <laughs> Northern Africa is part of Africa. But you see, someone from South Africa, you see, gives some ideas, yes. some suggestions. I think very worthwhile. I'm very far away. <laughs> yes, yes. I was going to say, I was going to say that's cheating, but. Uh, I, I don't think that we, I, will, I will apply it to you today. Um, you are quite right. Uh, I have constantly been amazed when I meet young people. And I, I mean, I, I've been uh, on this uh, semester at sea Lea and I have been on this now uh, twice, going right around the world. And I am constantly bowled over by the incredible idealism of the young people. Um, they go anywhere where they see poverty. Uh, they want to change that and and I think I mean that we we ought to be saying to them go ahead and and dream and dream I mean part of what is happening for instance in Egypt is is that um, they toppled the one regime but some of the power structures of that regime remain. I mean, the army is probably not uh, uh, one that has been reformed. Um, and the young people and, and the others are saying, no, this is not the kind of freedom we wanted. Uh, we, want, we want a freedom where those who govern are accountable. And, and I have a lot of time, I have a lot of faith in, in, in young people, and I always say to them, please do not allow yourselves to be infected 
by the cynicism of oldies like us, um, dream and, <coughs> and, 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 and they are inspired by people like Bono, like Geldof and others that poverty can be history. It is, it is, it is, it is possible for us one day to get it into our numb skulls that it is far better to invest the resources that we have, not in budgets of destruction and death, billions, when we can have a very minute fraction making sure that children everywhere have clean water to drink, have enough food to eat, have, I mean, have a good life. And I, I believe that we, we letting them down and we in the faith communities ought to be saying to people, do you know God created us for family. We belong together. We are sisters and brothers, not as a figure of speech, but really. And after all, we all began in one place, Africa. We are all Africans. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, those North African sort of states now recently uh, to see big change. So now I think the, as a people's sort of peaceful movement, finally big change uh, take place. Now, oh, I think uh, from I think you. You can show them the spirit of reconciliation. I think that's very important. But the recent months, violence, you see, naturally, you see, develop some sort of, uh, uh, difficult feeling, you know, some anger, some hatred, some sad sorrow. So, your spirit and your work uh, show them reconcil reconciliation is highly necessary. Then more sort of genuine unity built their nation yes. uh, uh, to achieve what they are dreaming. Their dream only materialized through their work, not just work. So, in order to carry unified work with full of enthusiasm, reconciliation is something very essential. So that, I think, my elder brother, I think have plenty of sort of experience to teach them to sort of to suggest them. This is one thing. Then, uh, these, uh, these years, recently, I also, you see, mentioning the corruption. Almost like new disease, new cancer of mm. the whole world, whole planet. Mm. Mm. So, mm. Myself also, you see, got the, you see, the Nobel Peace Prize. Peace means non-violence. Now here, the corruption, corrupt act, also kind of violence. Mm. Yeah. Violence, not only just physical sort of, sort of, sort of that, cheating, but cheating 
unjustly take advantage and these corruptions are also serious violence. So when we talk about non-violence, about promotion of every society, I think these you also should mention, should touch the uh, corruptions. I think that's very important, especially those the, uh, developing nations like China, India, and some other. Uh, the amount of money which come through corruption, if this money spent on the welfare of poorer sexual people, yeah. it can be some significant. I, know, I think in, <laughs> in your continent, Africa, also I heard from distance plenty of corruption. <laughs> Thank you, my I, friend. Yeah. Thank you. Thank I you. think that I think that we could go on all day long with these two very special friends talking with one another, but I know that we need to come to a close here. But Your Holiness, I would like to ask you one more thing. If you were going to give a gift from your heart to your very special 80-year-old friend here on his birthday, what is that gift that you would give to him? Firstly, as a religious or believer, Buddhist, I offer you sort of all my sort of virtues through my own practice, dedicate for your life. For your help. So the other day I mentioned you as a man of truth, man of God, please live long. I am looking for more, more. your 19th uh, birthday. I am looking forward. <laughs> 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 At that time, don't forget to send me invitation.
test, test your government. <laughs> Should we have one more happy birthday to the Archbishop? take this forward to give thanks to all of you, I just kind of felt a sense that because of the technologies of today, I had to stop my chairman in the middle uh, because this is being streamed internationally and the people in Delhi were wanting to connect immediately. So, chairman, I apologize for that and I wondered whether you wanted to was there anything else you wanted to say, or are you fine? No, no. You're fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then I can, with, with, a, with, a, with a relaxed heart, uh, do the vote of thanks. Thanks to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, for joining us. You said... South, African, uh, South Africans and the world said, let him in, and he came in. <laughs> thank you. I want to thank the Archbishop for being who he is. Yeah. I want to particularly thank UWC for hosting this with us. Thank you very much, UWC. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, for allowing us to use this great hall. In your program, I'd like to, at this time, thank all our sponsors, starting with UWC, the Norwegian Embassy, thank you very much. We were assisted by the Anglican Church of Southern Africa, Avis Foundation for Human Rights, the independent newspapers, and Jive. Those were our sponsors. You can still bring in more money to help with other things. Thank you. Thank you to all the staff members of the Desmond Tutu Peace Center and all the trustees who are here today. Maybe our trustees could just stand up so that I can clap them. Thank you very much for being here. Our trustees, thank you.
thanks to the security personnel, to the media, and all the camera people around us. Um, thanks. Thanks to uh, the media. Um, I wanted to actually leave this thanks for, for, the, for this time. I just really want to say thank you very much, Professor Judith Mayot, for doing this like no one would have done it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'm waiting for Mama Dudu at this time, but I'll, I'll just also thank uh, very much our project managers who've, I mean, this hall looks beautiful and everything has been organized to the T. Oryx Media, Roger Friedman and Benny Gould, thank you very much. And we all start. This would not have been possible. The lecture itself would not have been possible. The live stream would not have been possible without the generous offer and kindness of none other than Google. And I'd like to thank <laughs> Google. Thank Google for all that we have had today. Now, <laughs> there is a very special couple in our midst, Pam and Pierre Omadia who were willing to fly his holiness in had he be been given a visa. I just want to say thank you to you two. Thank you to all of you. I actually forgot something. There's, there's a last thing that I need to do. Uh, so, can, can you help me? This, this, this lady... Ladies and gentlemen, just, just before we sing, before we sing, this, ladies and gentlemen, is a beautiful cake for Mama Leia Dudu, who is celebrating her birthday on the 14th of October next week, Friday. It's a surprise. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear mama, happy birthday to you. Thank you, 
everyone. And you may now join us for a little snack. I don't know which side, but I think it's outside. Thank you very, very much. One day, at one of our graduations, Desmond Tutu said he has never heard the national anthem sung in the way in which it is sung in this hall by UWC students and parents. Now let's tell him, give him a reason to say he's never ever heard it sung the way it was sung today. Thank you.